What's up, everybody? My name's Jack, and I'm here to talk to you about death. My father died when I was 11, and it completely changed my life. And in this video, I want to share what my experience was like and how it has shaped me as a person and the troubles that I went through because of this. Because maybe one of you out there is going through something similar. And I know very well that when someone you love dies, you're not going to be prepared. So hopefully, if you watch this video, you're going to be more prepared, and you won't have to go through as much pain and loneliness as I did. So I'm going to start in the beginning. You understand, my, my father died when I was 12, okay? But before that, I had a pretty crazy life. I was born in Sri Lanka to an American mother and a British father, which is super weird, right? I only lived in Sri Lanka for one year, so I don't really have too many memories about that. After that, we lived in Africa for four years. After that, we lived in Saudi Arabia for three years. And then we moved to the United States. And now, one thing that I want you to understand is that I had a kind of flipped childhood. My mother was the one who earned the money and wasn't really around it very much. Whereas my father was home constantly and he was the one who was taking care of me, right? So I was very close to my father. Um, and I have become close to my mother now, but at, as a child, I was definitely much closer to my father. And so it all started, the hard thing started later, around 10. My father was smoking. He'd, he'd, he'd smoked cigarettes for a long time, and he actually stopped smoking cigarettes around the time I was born and would normally smoke out of a pipe. And I knew as a child that smoking was bad, and I wanted him to stop, so I would do things. I would, I would make no smoking signs and put them in his room and in the kitchen and stuff, and, and this really pissed him off, but also now I see, like, dang, that's, that's pretty hardcore, having your kid tell you to stop and then you die. He must have gone through some serious emotions there, you know? But so, my life was great for the first, like, 11 years. It was perfect. I mean, I was super happy. I got to see tons of different people, tons of different cultures, right? But then things got hard. And I remember the first day. My father had been sick. He was coughing a lot. Um, and it, just like a cough, like if you have pneumonia or something like that. Like, obviously, pneumonia sounds intense, but usually it won't kill you. But it was an intense cough. Um, and there was a night where I went into the bathroom, and there was blood all over the toilet. And I was just like, oh, that's weird. And I, I flushed it. I, I mean, I was just a little kid. I didn't really think too much about it, you know. But uh, a couple weeks after that, there was a phone call. And this was back in landlines, right, before cell phones. So the phone rang, and normally I would answer the phone and be like, hi, this is Jack, what do you want? And then they'd be like, oh, we want to speak to Diane Jackson or Trevor Pittman. And I'd be like, okay, and then I'd go and give my parents the phone or whatever, right? I'd be like, mom, and then she'd press the line. But on this particular call, for some reason, I felt weird. And instead of hanging up when my mom picked up the other line, I wanted to keep listening. And so I stayed on the line. And it was a doctor. And the doctor said, Trevor has cancer. He's been diagnosed with lung cancer. And he has a tumor the size of a tennis ball in his, ch in his lung. And I immediately was like, oh, I, uh, like, I understood why he was coughing so much. I, I got that part, right? So I hung up, and then obviously my mom heard me hang up, so she was like, oh shit, because it's not like they were trying to not tell me, they were just trying to protect me, and they didn't know how to tell me, and they had only found out like two or three weeks ago. So this wasn't the call that gave them the diagnosis, this was a call talking about the diagnosis, right? The memory's a bit fuzzy, because I don't remember the exact words, I just remember that phone call was how I found out that my father had lung cancer. Okay? And after that, what happened next? The next part's kind of pretty blurry, to be honest. Um, basically, he was given around, like, five months to live. Uh, he had cancer that was so late in the process that it was very unlikely he was going to live longer. He actually ended up living, like, a year and a half. Um, 
Not that that was a good thing. But so I had conversations with them. We talked. They t my parents told me what was happening. Um, but they were pretty optimistic in the beginning, definitely. I remember being alarmed, but I didn't feel super scared yet. Um, that was going to come later. I was optimistic in the beginning, and I was also more involved in, with my father's life at the time. Um, I spent more time with him. I wasn't just running away and doing other things with my time, right? I wasn't escaping from anything. But then it started to get worse. Um, eventually, the cancer metastasized, and he started to develop cancer in his brain. At this point, his behavior changed. And there was a night, I remember going to his room or the room that he was sleeping in and, and he was standing there and he had this weird like dizziness about him. And, and he looked at me and was like, Jack, I'm having trouble with, with my eight, my eight, it's, I'm having trouble. And I was like, what do you say? What? I, I don't, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then he fell on the ground. And he started seizing. And this was the point where the cancer had spread to his, his brain. And after that, it got way harder because he stopped being a person, really. It was just a body. He could sometimes recognize people when they came into the room. And sometimes when he talked to his friends, he would put a lot of effort into the conversation on the phone. But that all degraded eventually. And then I remember one day, my parents came home and they had a, a piece of software in their bag that was called Will Maker. And I got scared. That was the beginning of me realizing that my father was going to die and that my parents believed this. And at this point, he kind of started to give up and I can't say I blame him, definitely. Death is a hard thing to fight off because technically you always lose eventually. And shortly after this, there was a day where he would have periods where he was more cognizant, more aware and more able to talk and periods where he wasn't. And he uh, took me outside to, we had like a porch because we were building like an addition to the house at the time. And he took me outside and he said, Jack, I'm gonna die. This disease is going to kill me. And I was like, no, no, you're not. You're not gonna die. You're gonna fight it. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> but at this point, he'd sort of given up. And then I have one other major memory before he died. This is honestly the saddest point in my entire life. Even to this day, I've, I've never experienced something so heart-wrenching. Because I mentioned, I mentioned that my father used to cook a lot, right? He was like, he, he played the stereotypical stay-at-home mother role, except he was a father. He's a stay-at-home dad, right? And he cooked a lot. And, uh, there were some times where he would like try and make me something to cheer me up if I was sad or, or whatever. And one of my favorite uh, dishes was crepes, right? Like they're like flat European pancakes. Usually we would eat them with sugar and lemon. And I loved crepes because they were sweet and it was like a dessert, but it counted as breakfast for some reason. So it's something that always reminds me of my father. Um, and towards, towards the end, there was a point where he was trying to make me crepes. Um, but he couldn't really cook anymore. He wasn't, his brain wasn't working anymore. So he used like cornmeal instead of flour and then did something else and just made a big mess and it started burning. And just seeing him, like seeing him trying to do something to make me feel happy 
but then him not being able to. He literally just couldn't do it. He was trying to cook and he couldn't even understand what the ingredients were anymore. He couldn't understand how the pan worked. Like he poured stuff on the stove and watching that, I just, it was devastating for me. It's definitely, it's hard as you can tell, like I'm crying talking about this because it's hard to talk about. But remember, I'm not sharing this so that you can feel sorry for me or sad. I'm sharing this because most people don't. And I know someone watching this at some point will go through something like what I've been through. And I'm going to share things with you about how this experience has affected me and how, how it's made me a stronger person. But before I can get to that, I need you to understand everything that happened because we're still just in the beginning, right? So after that, he, he became bedridden pretty much. Um, he wasn't really able to talk. He was on hospice. Um, there was a DNR form on the door, do not resuscitate. So if he stopped breathing, nobody was supposed to try and jumpstart his heart or defibrillate him or give him CPR. We were just supposed to let him die. And I wanted him to die. I don't mean to sound selfish or anything, but he was in so much pain he couldn't talk anymore. He was just breathing and moaning, and that was it. And he was hooked into this, this oxygen tank, and it would just go... <sighs> like, he sounded like Darth Vader. <laughs> like, he couldn't talk anymore. Like, when you enter the room, he might, like, raise his eyes or something, or, or give some kind of body language that he recognized you, but that, that's about it. It was really hard to see him like that. And with time, it got worse. And then one day, uh, I was sleeping on a couch. I don't know why. I think, I think we had our aunt was visiting or something like that. So I needed to sleep somewhere else. And I remember uh, waking up, and my mom was in front of me, and she was shaking me. And she was like, Jack, it happened. And I was like, huh? What? And she was like, he, he's dead. And so I went to his room and I looked at him and I gave him a hug. And to be honest, I felt happy. I felt relieved. The hardest part wasn't him dying. It was seeing him decay, seeing him go from an amazing, supportive, charismatic father to just a shell. That's not even a person anymore. No more personality, just a body. It's barely breathing. So I was relieved when he died. Absolutely relieved. But that was only the beginning of the troubles, as you can imagine. When someone dies in your childhood, the death is hard, and depending on how traumatic it was, whether it happened overnight or over a long period of time, this is going to change things a little bit. But really, the hardest parts aren't the death. It's all the conversations later that never happen. It's all the times my life that are being incredibly lonely and I don't have a father to talk to I don't have that it's all the times that I felt overwhelmed or scared and there wasn't really a, a, a male role model in my life to be there for me and so I was forced to become that I, I, I knew that if I did not take control of my life I was going to get fucked up because I had another friend whose dad died. And he, that friend killed himself like four years later. And if you're not careful, if you don't talk about this stuff, it's going to fuck you up. And you have a choice to make. You can either let the things that happen in your life destroy you. Or you can find ways to make those things make you stronger. And that's what I want you to understand. No matter what happens... You can't change anything. You can't change anything about the past. You can't change anything that's happened to you. The only thing you can change is how you respond to it. And you have to tell yourself it's making you stronger. You have to find every single possible reason that you can for you to become a better, more capable person because of the trauma that you experienced. Because nothing you do is going to take that trauma away. And this is what happened with me. I knew this from a very young age, and I knew I had to talk about it. I had to keep talking to people about it. 
I had to talk about what I was going through because if I didn't, then it would destroy me. And it changed my life a lot, definitely. Things were really hard uh, for a long time because I was really sad. I was really lonely. And my mother was just as sad and lonely. She had come to a new country and then her husband had died. And she didn't have any friends. We were both in a really, really bad place. But you know, sometimes I think that maybe I'm better off because of this. Because I had a hard time when I was between 12 and 17. But every year since then, my life has gotten so much better. And now I have a life where I have complete and total freedom. I'm not wealthy, but I'm my only obstacle. Everything in my life is taken care of. I don't need to work eight hours a day doing something I don't love. And I've been able to get this life, a life where I am my own person and I can be anywhere that I want and I'm surrounded by people that I love. I've been able to have this life because I lost so much as a child that it showed me what's really important in this world. And there's only a few things that are actually important and they all have to do with people. No matter what you do, no matter how accomplished you become or how talented you become, it's never enough if you don't have a community of people that you love and relate to and you feel part of. Your focus in life should be how can you be the best to people around you and how can you attract people who you want to become like to you as a person. And I'm really glad that I was able to go through all of these things and learn this at such a young age because it's allowed me to now have a life where I'm essentially retired. I can do anything that I want. If I want to do something that's really expensive, then I have to set up a project to earn more money. But I have 40 hours a week to do whatever I want, right? More than that, really. But there's a 40-hour block that's taken away from people, from jobs that I don't have to deal with. I can spend every single day doing what I think is most relevant to my development as an individual. I'm 26 and I'm retired. I don't need to do anything, technically. All my bills are paid for by work I've done in the past. I live a pretty frugal life. I don't have a car. I don't like live in a crazy fancy place. I don't go out and party a whole lot. But I'm really happy and I've become an incredibly charismatic person who draws people to me and who is able to talk very articulately about very intense subjects that a lot of people struggle with. I've become a person who is incredibly valuable to those around me. And I know with confidence that I improve the life of anybody who is close to me in a way that many other people don't. And all of this is because of the trauma that I went through as a child. So if you're going through this, I've got one major piece of advice for you. You got to talk about it. People aren't necessarily going to want to hear it. Like me making this kind of video, most of you guys are never going to watch this. If you're watching this part right now, you represent maybe 1% of the people who actually watch this video. People don't want to hear about emotional stuff, but don't let that stop you from talking about it. You have to express yourself. You have to talk about it. And second, you have to figure out how can it make you stronger? In the beginning, it's gonna feel like you're lying to yourself. How can you make a death be a good thing? But you gotta keep telling yourself. You gotta just focus on one thing that it's changed about you. In the beginning, for me, it was my appreciation of people because I didn't tell you everything about when my father died. I just told you some of the more intense parts. But I mentioned he was sick for a long time. And in the beginning, I was involved in his life. By the end, I was not. And I regret that. I ran away. I was only reading books all day. I didn't want to visit him in the hospital. I was scared. And I think that in some ways, my father died feeling alone. And I knew that I, I was his world. I was everything to my father. He was an amazing dad, absolutely amazing. And I didn't know that back then, but now I see how I am as a person and all the good things that he did to me growing up that most of my male friends never got to experience. 
he was there for me in a way that even though he died, I'm still better off than a lot of people whose parents are still alive. He was able to change my life drastically in only 11 or 12 years of interacting. At this point, I have been alive for 26 years. My father's been dead for 14 years or 15 years. He was only in my life for 11. Over half of my existence has been without a father. And I regret that I wasn't as loving to him towards the end. I regret that I, I was scared and that I ran away because it showed me that you can never, ever treat people badly. Even if you're angry, even if you think you have a good reason to, you don't know what's gonna happen. And trust me, you don't wanna treat someone badly and then have them walk out the door and get hit by a car and die. You don't wanna have that on your mind knowing that the last thing you ever did to them was something bad. And so I'm telling you this because in the beginning for me, that's what I focused on. I focused on thinking about that and thinking, look, okay, I can treat people better now because I, I, I experienced this and I never want to do that again. I never want to do something that I'm going to regret. I want to be able to treat people really well so that I'm always acting as if maybe I'm going to lose them tomorrow. I always want to be at my best and most loving to people as I possibly can. And that was the first thing that I started telling myself. I was like, look, yeah, he's dead, but he taught you this. You learned from this. You can get more strong because of this. And that's what you have to do. You, if you're going through death, if you're going through some kind of trauma like this, you have to figure out something that it's making you improve in. And you have to just keep telling yourself that over and over and over and over again. Because the reality is, you're always going to be affected by this death. My father died 15 years ago, but here I am crying. I made this video because I was sad and I was crying and I was thinking how I wish that, sometimes I wish that he didn't die. I wish that I knew what it was like to, to have my first crush at school or something and then to talk to my dad about it. I wish, I wish I had had experiences where we listened to music together and he showed me, talked to me about his childhood. I wish that I was having some kind of problem in a relationship and I could go to him for advice. These are, these are all experiences that I didn't get to have. And that's the hardest part. It's not the death, it's not the, the trauma, it's everything you miss out on. So if you can figure out how that you, figure out how to not miss out on that. Sometimes, I think that way, but you have to be really careful because you can't change anything about the past. You can't change anything that happened. And it, it's great to think what if, like these things I just said, these heart-wrenching things, what if he had been there? What if I'd had these conversations? What if he hadn't died? What would I be like? What about all the hundreds of times in my life I've been lonely and sad and crying? And there's nobody there. What if none of that had happened? But that's impossible. You have to be able to flip everything. You have to be able to take the hard things that happen to you and make yourself stronger because of them. Because death is always going to affect you. And at the end of your life, you're going to die. And the worst thing that you can do is live a life of regret where you do not do things. Where you think, oh, I wish I had done this. I wish, I wish, I wish. Don't do that. Don't waste your time here, and also don't waste other people's. If you're angry, express it, but don't lash out to people. Figure out how you can get out of that as soon as possible and be loving and nurturing to those around you. If you make little jokes about people insulting them, poking fun at them, be careful. Because you don't know what's going on with them. You don't know what they're going through in their minds. And they could be in a really vulnerable moment. You say that, and then they go off and die. Don't let that happen. Don't waste your time here. And make sure that you're good to other people. And when you go through a trauma like this, 
you got to make sure you talk about it and you focus on the good. Find something that you're better at because of it and focus on it. Talk about it over and over and over and over again. Tell yourself it until it becomes true. That's your only option. But for what it's worth, I think you're better off because I know so many people who haven't been through trauma and they're miserable, they're depressed because they don't realize that their life doesn't have what they need to be happy. Trauma is an opportunity for you to learn exactly what you need to be at your best and for you to become a strong enough person to be happy regardless to what happens to you. You can get there, I promise. If you play your cards right, you can make this trauma or this death that you're going through something that creates an amazing strength within you that makes people admire you, respect you, and want to be around you. And that is the key to everything that you want to accomplish in your life. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I know I haven't done this kind of emotional talk in a long time. And I also know that this is 30 minutes of me rambling. You guys didn't listen to that, but that's okay. If you ever want to do any kind of consulting with me, I offer free and paid consulting. You can book a free call. It's 30 minutes and I record it and publish it to my YouTube channel. Or you can pay $20 to talk to me for 30 minutes. I will do whatever you want. I will share any kind of information. If you need moral support about something, if you want to talk about trauma, if you need just a, an ear to talk to something hard that you're going through and you want to make sure that you're talking to somebody who's not going to judge you, I'm here for you. Just click on the Calendly link in the description of this video. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Ciao.